Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gitty Mary and today I am going to share with you my journey towards zero waste and beyond. I want to talk about how I got to where I am today, how I got to treat zero waste and content creation in general as my job. It's going to be sort of like a story time timeline-esque video. I don't know, this was sort of requested and I think it's a really cool video to do, sit down and talk. I already made like a story time-esque video about my journey from being like super into meat and into being a vegan for life and it's sort of going to be the same vibe but not with veganism but with sustainable in general. Also made a blog post that you can find down below about how to get started blogging and how to start earning money from a blog about sustainability. So we sort of cover some different ground here, but let's talk about my journey to zero waste. My childhood was very affected by my mom's work. She is an artist and I think she started living only from her art in the beginning of the 2000s and she is still doing so she's an absolute badass that way um, but I remember in my childhood being very focused on creativity and emotional expression and it was generally just a very healthy household that I grew up in um, but we didn't have a lot of money or resources in general so we started thrifting when I was very very young that has always been something that's been super normal in my family um, so I remember my brother and I both thrifting clothes sometimes, but most of the time my mum did that part. But specifically when I was younger, my brother and I, we thrifted toys all the time and we created sort of our own games. <laughs> One thing I remember specifically is that my brother and I, we would uh, thrift small buttons and we would use those as toys. So we would use them in board games and we would create our own board games where the template for the board game was sort of the rug in the living room. We also spent tons of time at the library so a lot of the things that we had in our home were borrowed things. Um, from the library we'd go I think every once a month or something like that and return them and then get new things and it was really really nice and the local library also had tons of summer holiday activities so we didn't really travel a whole lot when I was younger we did a little bit but it's not something that affected our family a whole lot uh, and so instead we spent tons of time in the forest in the library at the beach all of these things are in their essence quite sustainable you know like living in smaller homes borrowing instead of buying from new or buying prey loved but we didn't really do any of these things because we wanted to be a sustainable household we did them because we sort of needed to. I know it's because that we didn't necessarily have a whole lot of resources but that's just not the impression I have at all. Like no one was ever sad or angry or frustrated or depressed or stressed out about any of this stuff. I mean I guess the adults were but <laughs> I didn't really notice because I just had a great time. Uh, we may do with a lot less than the average family I'm pretty sure uh, but we just had an amazing time. We spent so much time together and we sort of bonded over very simple activities. Um, I remember one summer my brother and I got this ball. I think it was from a Happy Meal from McDonald's and we used, we played with this ball throughout the entire summer. It was the only new toy that we got this entire summer and we loved this thing to bits. But it wasn't really bound up on sustainable living. I think the sustainable things that I learned when I was a child was don't throw garbage in nature because duh. Uh, save water and remember to turn off the lights whenever you leave a room. Those were sort of, I think, I guess very basic sustainability lessons that we teach our kids. Um, but still I think perhaps some elements of my childhood have been different from other people's experiences of childhood. But we always just had such an amazing time. And I think one of the reasons why that is, is because my mom was an independent artist, so she was her own boss. So I always grew up with seeing adults who were allowed to assess their own time and prioritize when they wanted to work and when they didn't want to work. Maybe that's why I also became an independent business owner. I remember one summer, the weather was really good outside and my brother and I really wanted to go on a trip. We all had bikes, we didn't have a car. And um, so we would bike everywhere in the local area and see whatever there was to see. And in the living room, we built a tiny office space for my mom. And then we made her sit as the boss behind the desk and say, what do you want today? And then we made her switch places uh, into the employee seat and go, I kind of want to take the day off, is that okay? And then switch back into the boss's seat to go, yeah, okay, I think that's great. Um, I just, yeah, we just had tons of fun and I think generally my childhood was very affected by this flexibility of my mom's work and that's something that I want to take with me as well for myself. 
um, I was this very stubborn and creative and expressive child. I had this huge basketball of tea and I cut it open down the middle and then I sewed it back together with big thick red string, sort of like a yarn situation. In a novelty store I bought this silk red tie, but it wasn't like a tying tie, it was a pre-tied tie in a little elastic band that you could, I think it was for a costume honestly, and I would wear this thing constantly. I had this incredible attachment to things that I loved um, because we didn't have a lot of things. So the things that I did have I really really loved and it was something that I was always really appreciative of. Um, I've also learned in a very young age how to repair things when they break, how to maintain things so they don't break, all this kind of stuff. So I guess my point of this first part of the video is to say that a lot of the lessons that we want to learn in sustainability and a lot of the lessons people are trying to teach within sustainability is all something that can be tied up in having less than the average person. A lot of indigenous communities have been doing this for the longest time and a lot of these zero waste principles is something that's born out of poverty or generally just not having as much as average people or the middle class. I don't know how else to put it, but does it make sense? I I think I have experienced a tiny fraction of what this have meant, um, but in many other aspects I know my family have been extremely privileged still. Okay, so I want to skip further a little bit into high school. Now this is not super relevant to sustainability, but I think it's also worth mentioning that throughout my childhood and pre-teen years, and honestly also teen years, I went through quite a style development. So I started out like this Mitch matchy hippie kind of aesthetic moved into sort of a very dark scene emo face and ended up sort of afterwards in like this J fashion decora inspired aesthetic that I really loved. Then I went into sort of like an old lady Victorian style and then I ended up at fashion week in high school. So there's a big difference in the narrative from my childhood and then from my teen years. This is from, I don't know, like I was 15, 16 to I was 18 or 19 ish. When I was in high school or the gymnasium in Denmark, um, I got really into fashion like a lot. I think it was in 2012 I started my first fashion blog where I would sort of just share outfit of the day, styling tips etc. And most of the things that I used were fast fashion. I still used a lot of thrift shopping, I have always done that and even through my hyper consumerist years I still did thrift shopping. Primarily because it was super cheap and you can get you know fast fashion brands in the thrift shops. Aha. Uh -huh. But also because thrift shops in Denmark are super super available. They are on most street corners, they are in every small town so it's really easy to get to them and often in my childhood and early teen years it was easier to find thrift shops than fast fashion shops and I was still at this point where I didn't really shop online like that was not something you did because you were scared that uh, the internet would eat your credit card I don't know and then I got a weekly allowance from my dad um, I did some small work here and there like you know restaurant work and waitressing stuff like that so I had some money but not a lot I feel like but I spent most of it on fast fashion items. <laughs> I think it was in my second year I went to my first fashion events sort of. I went to a launch of a H&M collab in Copenhagen, I went to some fashion shows, I started taking up street style photography whenever I was specifically both in Aarhus and in Copenhagen for press events or any kind of event where I was hoping to see some well-dressed people and that sort of led me to fashion week where I would also get hired as a street style photographer. I would also go there to take pictures for my own personal blog and then I would plan these really extravagant cool not fit for the season whatsoever outfits that I could have photo documented so people could see that I was super fashionable and yeehaw. The amount of times that I have been wearing small tiny stiletto pumps and a crop top in February Simply just going, you know what, it's worth it, I'll get sick later, it's fine. So I started working as a street style photographer and I also did some writing jobs here and there for Danish style magazines. And this led me to this wild overconsumption of things, both because I started receiving some press samples and some gifts from companies, but also because I started having the money to buy things. Still these things I bought wasn't necessarily expensive. Um, I very rarely bought something that cost more than 20 quid, 
but still you could accumulate a lot of stuff. Some of it was secondhand and thrifted, but a lot of it was H&M's discount pile. I also started traveling with school and I think also me and my mom and my high school boyfriend went to London at one point and whenever I was anywhere, during these years. I wouldn't go to museums, I wouldn't go to theatre, I wouldn't go and see anything interesting. I just wanted to shop and that was everything I wanted to do. All shopping all the time. And this sort of led me to accumulate a lot of stuff. I had over 100 pairs of shoes and I turned my entire room into a walk-in closet. So I had, I think, three or four clothing racks and my closet as well. And it was all filled up with clothes that I didn't really wear. I also remember feeling empty basically all the time. It was also during my high school years that I developed disordered eating issues and just I felt so empty all the time and one of the ways that I tried to combat that feeling was by buying new things because it gave me a sudden rush to find something on discount or generally to go home with something that I could try on my mirror and feel good about myself. But obviously as I think this is something we've heard a million times but that feeling of euphoria when you buy something new is so fleeing and I have absolutely felt that on my own body for sure. Still the thing that I wanted to do the most once I finished high school was that I wanted to work in fashion. So I spent a gap year before university just pursuing this thing and I went to tons of events and parties and met tons of interesting people, now very famous people. And sure I really had a blast most of the time. I also rarely went to these events alone so I would bring some of my friends and it was such a nice time we would get lots of stuff for free we were very, very young and we thought that was you know like peak living it was not peak living but I also remember not feeling welcome wherever I went. The people I remember working with and around that were in the same place as me, that wanted the same things as I did, uh, was very quick to sort of throw other people under the bus to seem better themselves. I remember one of the people that I worked with, we lived in this hotel suite together and we were just bloggers and street style photographers, both of us, but she told a journalist that I was her assistant to seem more important. A lot of this stuff happened and whenever I got home from Fashion Week or from these press days, I always remember just feeling relief that I was not there anymore because I was so defensive all the time and I really had to look out for what people were saying about me and it was really tiring and a really toxic environment to be in, at least for me. So after my gap year I decided to go to the university and study English and culture. It was very close to my hometown as well, about an hour, and I moved there and it was just around that time that I also learned about zero waste as a concept. I think this lifestyle was dropped in my lap at the exact right time in my life because just a couple of months before that I wouldn't have been willing to assess and reflect upon my consumption or upon my own life and how everything worked or specifically didn't work. It was at the perfect moment in my life that I found out what zero waste was and it was a complete coincidence. I was sitting on my laptop scrolling through Facebook when I suddenly came across an article about Lauren Singer and about her trash jar and how she could fit three years of trash in this mason jar. And I started reading the article because I thought it was really interesting how trash were photographed and displayed because I didn't have this relationship with my own trash at all. And it sort of made me reassess my relationship with waste. And at this point I did have sort of like a style change that had happened over the last half a year where I sort of went from being less super squared, boom, boom, fashion, to more like a more rounded, like boho inspired person um, so that also fit very well with the sustainability angle that sort of just came sneaking in later I guess. So I asked my followers, I think I had about 6,000 followers at this point, if they would be interested in watching me reduce my waste over the next month because I would want to go through a 30 day zero waste experiment where I wouldn't want to be generating any waste. And um, there was some positive feedback 
not a lot a lot of people during this month especially stopped following me but i also did gain tons of new followers that perhaps felt more in alignment with the content i was now creating now this was in 2014 and there was not a lot of talk about sustainability or even zero waste at this point and one of the reasons why i was so intrigued by the lifestyle was because a lot of the talk about sustainability at this point was very abstract it was very what can the government do what committees are in place what co2 quotas are in place at this point many consumers were very removed from the sustainability talk and discourse and we weren't really included in what we can do as consumers even though there's tons of stuff that we can do so i think this was one of the reasons why i was so intrigued by zero waste my initial inspiration was the trash jar and since then i have renounced it there wasn't a lot of people talking about zero waste in Denmark either. I don't think I was the first one to talk about zero waste, but I think I was one of the first five people to talk about it. And there wasn't a lot of sustainability influencers or bloggers or content creators to follow either. I remember that I looked up to Bia Johnson from my zero waste home and Lauren Singer from Trashes for Tossers. I don't follow either anymore and I will get into how and sort of why I've developed and changed in the zero waste lifestyle. Because my initial introduction to zero waste was very bound up on the trash jar that's also how i started myself i have talked about this many times before this is at this point i think not an unknown opinion on my channel but i think it is bogus that's the nicest way I can say it. I was very anxious the first couple of years of zero waste. I was very focused on trying to make things perfect. And I remember feeling anxious and almost like nauseous when I got some plastic in my house or in my hands that I didn't expect to get. I remember feeling really frustrated with my friends if they brought over a plastic bag either for a gift or if they brought beers or anything like that if they brought plastic into my home i would start to feel nauseous and i would get really sick and annoyed with them on a similar note whenever we went to restaurants i would of course say and no straw please and if i got a straw anyway the whole night would have been ruined i was so scared of messing up and i think one of the reasons why that was was because all I knew about sustainability and how to live sustainably in zero waste was avoid plastic at all costs. And of course today still I think it's a good idea to avoid plastic but I won't get nauseous if I get some plastic that I didn't expect to get. That's just a toxic relationship right there. I spent the first two or three years in zero waste being very focused on the physical trash, the stuff in my bin, the things that I didn't want to see. And because of that, I didn't really pay any attention to impacts that I couldn't see. And it took me quite a while to realize that the way that I was flying everywhere and the way I was eating meat every day perhaps wasn't the best idea. <laughs> I remember once that I was going on vacation and we were flying there and I put on Instagram that I was on a zero waste trip because I got the plane ticket on my phone and I said no to peanuts in packaging on the plane. In a similar manner I had meat basically every day. Many times a day as well. I had a very toxic relationship with meat at this point because, and I've talked about this more in the vegan, veganism journey to veganism video, but um, I was very insecure throughout most of my teenage years and also in my early adult years. And I saw that whenever I consumed big amounts of meat and like huge steaks, people would think that I was cool and boys would think that I was cool. So I also went to the butchers with my own jars and I got my meat in my jars and I was like, hashtag zero waste, this is amazing. And I'm not saying it's their fault, but the first two people I followed within the zero waste movement also flew everywhere and ate meat and dairy all the time. And I saw on their platforms that that was okay. So I was sort of reassured that this is still fine. I'm still sustainable. I am still zero waste. And that meant that I could sort of disregard all the comments about CO2 and methane emissions and animal agriculture and the problem with leisure flights everywhere because the persons that I looked up to were doing it. So I gave my first lecture in 2016. It was a very informal thing, but I was super duper nervous and I had my friends and my family then, everyone was there. But it really made me realize that I also want to talk to real people. I 
don't just want to post pictures and work with Instagram. So I started including a folder on my blog that was called lectures, booking, etc. where people could see that this was something that I was offering. At this point, I think I've given 200 lectures or something like that. I've talked quite a lot to quite a lot of people and I'm so grateful that I'm able to do that. And it all started with this coincidence because I didn't really think that this was something that I could do. I was contacted by the venue and they wanted me because they knew that in Old Book people knew me a little bit as the person who talked about plastic free living, yay. And they asked me if I was offering speeches and lectures and workshops and stuff like that. And that made me think that, hey, I could actually do this. At the same time as I've evolved in the lifestyle, I've evolved as a person, which means that I've evolved in my lifestyle and those things are just super, super interconnected and you can't really remove my personal growth from my sustainability growth. When I started Serial Waste, I was very focused on perfection and the physical trash that I was creating and not creating. And it was almost to the point of self-destruction. I didn't really like my life. I, and there was a lot of reasons for this. This was not only because of zero waste. It was also because a lot of personal things were happening to me. Um, if you've been following me on my platform for quite some time, you will know that I broke off an engagement two months before the wedding. I had to discover myself completely from scratch. I had to reevaluate a lot of things and with it, also came zero waste. And I learned that I need to chill. You are not in control of everything that happens in your life. And living perfectly zero waste assumes that you are in control all the time. No one is. At this point, I guess the mantra of this channel is no one can live perfectly zero waste in a society not designed for it because I say it all the time. Because I need you to understand this. I need people to not feel the way that I felt once I got a straw that I didn't ask for or a bag of peanuts that I didn't ask for or people left a beer bag at my place. I need people to not feel this anxious. It's going to completely suck out all motivation and encouragement and passion for the environment that is so important to nurture and keep alive and healthy. This is why I've also started to incorporate an aspect of my vlogs where I show you how much waste I generate in a day so you can see how much it varies. I'm not only here to teach people and to show people how I live sustainably in zero waste, I also want to encourage a healthy way of being in the lifestyle, a way where you can be here and you can maintain it and pursue it for many years to come because if I hadn't changed the way that I was living in this lifestyle, I don't think I would be here anymore or like I would live but like I don't think I would be living zero waste. I don't think I would be making content about it because I was so over it. It's so draining to feel like a failure all the time and I feel like early zero waste living online kind of gave off a vibe that was either you're perfect or you're out. All the things I learned about waste reduction and the importance of tackling the plastic issue I think are just as important as when I first started Zero Waste. But since then I have gained so much perspective. I've learned tons more about privilege and sustainable communities, indigenous communities and cultural sustainability and significance. I have learned that just because something is possible for me doesn't mean that it's possible for everyone else. And I've learned that it's okay to to point fingers and shame big ass companies, but not other consumers. I've gained so much perspective in context of how I communicate sustainability and how I can make it easier for other people to make their own adjustments and their own decisions and not just assume that everyone will use my experiences as a blueprint for their own lives because that's just not how anything works. I think waste reduction and tackling the waste problem is just as important as when I first started Zero Waste. But I now also know that a lot of the issues that we have right now doesn't have a physical form per se, that there's tons of trash and waste and impact that we need to focus on that doesn't necessarily end up in the consumer's bins because we won't ever be able to see it. To me at least it doesn't make sense anymore to only talk about plastic waste when we talk about sustainability because there's so many other factors that count us in and they are just as important and sometimes even more important. I now believe that we cannot talk about sustainability without acknowledging all of these issues both in terms of emissions, how we use the internet, fast fashion production, 
animal agriculture, plane travel, shipping in general. There's so many other aspects of sustainability that we need to acknowledge are real issues. And we cannot just only focus on straws and plastic bags because that feels convenient to us. At least that's where I am right now. We can still talk about straws and plastic bags. Obviously, there is a chance that when I started Zero Waste, I used these small Zero Waste symbols like the straw and the plastic bag as green alibis because then it meant that I could keep doing the plane traveling that I did and I could keep eating my big steaks because I was zero waste. I did this thing so I didn't have to think of anything else. And I know that's not necessarily my thought process back then, but looking back, there has definitely been an aspect of that in there somewhere. So evolving in this lifestyle and evolving as a person in general has made me able to see my own biases and reflect upon them and assess them and make sure that I do better next time. And I think that's super duper important. So important that I ended up saying super duper. <sighs> That was quite a mouthful. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video and if you watched all the way to the end, congratulations, you're the winner of my channel. <laughs> thank you so much for watching though and thank you so much for the amazing support that I always hear from you. I am so grateful every single day. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, you can do that right here. That would make my day. We talk about many other things than this super duper feely type stuff, um, but once in a while it's nice to throw some emotions in there. And if you have anything you want to add or ask, leave a comment down below and I'll definitely get to it. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and take really good care of yourselves. Until next time. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys helped me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!